Hej allihopa och välkommen till Pengaflöde-podcasten. Mitt namn är Emily. Och mitt namn är Anna. Vi håller på med fastighetsinvesteringar i Storbritannien. Och den här podden kommer handla om just detta och vi kommer varje vecka att ta upp relevanta ämnen och intervjua personer som vi finner hey! inspirerande. Och välkomna till Pengaflöde-podcasten. Today we have D. Ludlow. How is it D? How are you mate? Good to, ha- good to be on the show. It's good to have you. So today we're going to talk about all about economics, property, but I mean economics goes into property and if you don't got that right, you're strange. <laughs> so tell me about your background, D. So um I've been in um business most of my life. Um I've had many different ventures uh And yeah, I just property's always been something that I've um that I've had an interest in, but just mainly um investing as a whole. I've seen a lot of people and the people that I've looked up to invest across many different asset classes and I feel, think is key at some point to diversify because when one asset isn't doing too well, there's always another that is. So yeah, my background mainly has always been I feel that I'm just um like a world explorer. I I like to explore everything. I love I love travel. Um, and I definitely love touching on different things within the financial markets and just different investment tools. Yeah, that's good. That's good. We should, should always diversify, and I like to travel as well. I bet you like food as well, right? Oh, I love food. <laughs> <laughs> so should we deep dive into it? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. So what is going on in the UK? Microeconomics. So, what is going on in macroeconomics? And please, the people that maybe don't know what it's about, ta- uh, tell them what microeconomics is. So, well, the way things are right now, um, it's sort of hard to keep track of the metrics from a macroeconomic level um, because of basically the disconnection between what's real and what's not. Um, the reason why I say this, so if you look at the stock market, for instance, um, there's an indicator called um, the Buffett indicator, and it's basically the total market cap of the stock market um, divided by the GDP. And the higher the measure means the more overva- overvalued the stock market is. And um, so right now, there's a huge disconnection between the stock market and the GDP. You know, it's huge. So like you, you hear people who say, you know, stocks always go up. Um, but let's say you bought, you know, Microsoft around the year 2000, you you wouldn't have broke even until 15 years later. And, you know, it was a profitable and growing business the whole entire time. So when we're paying around 500 times or more earnings for a stock today, we need to think about, you know, the long term consequence of that. So when the money supply is expanded and unemployment rises and the velocity of money declines, then the economy shouldn't really look like this. You know, it looks like it's growing from a stock market or housing market point of view. But right now, you know, if you use both of those, it does look like we're doing fairly well. And, you know, let's not forget about debt is at gigantic levels. And, you know, we've got we've had more corporate and consumer debt than we have ever had. And global debt is over 300 percent. So, yes, it, we're not in a great place. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So people, sorry for laughing, but this is so so real. The the stats, you know, and I, my myself, I've been looking at this, listen to uh, people that are into this as long uh, as well, like Ray Dalio and etc. And even they are saying uh, it's too much depth, you know, mm. it's too much depth. Yeah, hundred percent. So tell me about the different schemes that are available in UK. So at the moment, there's a lot of, lot of incentives going on. So there's a mortgage holiday incentives, stamp duty incentives. Um, there's a lot of stimulus and QE. So basically QE is just, you know, um, it's just a tool that, you know, the central banks use to inject money directly into the economy. And this is sort of a tool that they use. So when things um, look like they're going in in a downward direction or going bad, then they'll either, their tool tools they like to use are, Um, print money and then drop rates so um, to try and get the velocity of money moving they they give us stamp duty incentives 
uh, permitted development incentives, um, mortgage holidays, um, furlough, bounce back loans. They, they put all these things in place <laughs> to try and keep the economy stable. But when you look at it from a macro level and you look at the charts that actually matter, it, it's not doing anything. So they're printing money. Um, this is happening all around the world. They're dropping rates all around the world and printing money all around the world. And it's, it's not doing anything. So the velocity of money is still pretty much at zero. It's under one in most European countries and is around one in the States. And it's literally not doing anything. So they're printing money, but it's not working anymore. It feels like sort of monetary policy has just been misused um, on a mass level. And I think that that's why there's a potential... Um, of the big change and that's why the IMF are talking about Bretton Woods 2.0 etc yeah yeah definitely it, it's it seems like like this you mentioned the stamp duty holiday mm. uh they're even talking about extending it and mm. like it seemed like they're forced to do it yeah I think they're just trying anything to keep you know, they, they, it's like they're kicking the can down the road right it's been going on for a long time yeah. since 2008 and it's it's rather than just allow things to reset and the thing is when things go too far you need to have you need to reset you need to have a huge pullback and you know this this is if you look at any sort of if you look at the financial markets anything that, that goes up in a straight line always has a pullback at some point but it's like they try and not to have a pullback on the especially the UK housing market it's just trying to it's sort of the main confidence within the economy from just average Joe public who looks at what's going on in the economy they think if the housing market is strong um, then we're okay whereas in America they're more concerned about the stock market so we're, they're trying to keep this housing market as confident and as much as much hope in it as possible and up to now it's worked um, yeah. <laughs> 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 so is it a pandemic crisis or is it a financial crisis so this is kind of a mom height question <laughs> um you know <laughs> we've been obviously in a very long debt cycle and it was going to come to an end either way in my opinion you know this this is a health crisis but no doubt you know it sparked a reaction to the debt cycle and exposed a lot of bad companies and institutions so i believe this is a health crisis that will evolve into a financial crisis or even worse a depression um you know when you look at what we, what we was doing, what was going on back in 2008, and um, all they, they said that everything was in a bubble then. When you look at the magnitude of where we are now, <laughs> if they like, if they thought that was a bubble and they don't think this is a bubble, then I'm not sure if people are looking at the right things because facts and figures state the truth, and that's all we can look at right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm always about facts and figures. That, that that's the you know you can you can sugarcoat everything, but <laughs> the figures and facts is always there. Yeah. <laughs> so as an investor, what should you do right now? All of this. So every investor is different, and we all have different risk card, uh, criteria. So for me, you know, we are moving into a digital world, and so I'm very bullish crypto, um, blockchain and also bullion to a certain extent. Um, but until we have an actual reset in our monetary system, I do see a lot of dollar strength. Um, even though they're printing a lot of money, there's dollar shortage around the world. And so I'm quite bullish on dollar um, short short term, probably over the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, until we, until we reset, I think it's just more about being cautious. You know, the US indices, um, have a lot of strength at the moment based on a lot of stimulus and a lot of hope and confidence. Um, and, I'm, and when the second round of stimulus comes, maybe that will push them even higher again, these crazy valuations right now. But I do think um, one in the next 24 months, we will see a big dip in both the stock market and the housing market. So that's why I'm focused on crypto mainly and also bullion, um, even you know deflationary assets and sort of safe havens. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin's got a long way to go. And so has a lot of cryptos and the whole world's endorsing them right now. You know, you see the big institutions endorsing them. Now, I know a lot of people are talking about governments banning Bitcoin. But from where I'm looking and from where I'm reading, it's looking like governments are endorsing them opposed to banning them. And when you look at sort of the IMF's website and the, 
the the stuff they're putting out the bis and the, even the world economic forum is if you look at what everybody's doing there it looks like banks are sort of saying you know bitcoin's here it's here to stay so we're going to create our digital currencies but bitcoin is part of the whole new system now so there you know at some point it may happen but you know i feel like we're a long way from now like at the moment bitcoins were you know market caps around 300 billion and when you think of the gold market it's 10 trillion so <laughs> it's, it's so far away from even thinking about you know if we're thinking of gold as a safe haven and now bitcoin is now uh, apparently the digital gold then you know it's a long way away when you look at market caps between the both so until um bitcoin gets to a more substantial market cap i can't see governments even caring about it at the moment it's, it's small it's small news it's just it's a lot of hype in the newspapers and the the headlines at the moment so you you're you're talking about this reset let's say if a reset would uh happen hmm. what do you think will happen then well how will i mean a lot of companies banks will all uh yeah default yes um yeah, I, I feel we're, we're definitely um, on the brink of seeing a lot of defaults. I think they're already still happening. I just think that they're not being uh, put out there to the general public. So when you see this many companies, especially in the UK right now, going into administration, we've had the biggest retail and shopping chain companies into administration, some massive corporations that's been around for a long time. And same in the States, it's the same in same a, a, a lot of places around the world. So the defaults, I believe are already happening. I think they're going to be more publicly known um, very soon. And when the defaults start happening on um, a corporate level and they sort of trickle down into the public and the public start defaulting on their debt. So, you know, if I was to um, say I, I lost my job and say I, I, I'm just, I work for a company, I've lost my job. And, you know, let's say the first thing I'm going to default on is more than likely going to be my credit card. I'm going to try and save my car and my house. And then when financial pain, um, you know, increases and still you can't get another job because this is going to be the reality for some people. Now, some people will be able to drop into another job, but a lot of people won't. And then what happens next is their car loan. And then after their car loan is their mortgage or rent. And then the thing is with this is, so when you look at it from an investor point of view, if you if that's your tenant, you know, how many properties have you got? How much debt have you got to service? And what you got to look at this on a bigger scale too. So um, it's easy to think about it for, say, the average person. But then what about when Delta and American Airlines laid off thousands of pilots? Some of those pilots are on 250K a year. Now, you know, what job are they going to get if there's no jobs for pilots out there? Because travel, regardless of the vaccine news, who knows when travel's going to, you know, it's going to be a long time before travel goes back to where it was. So these pilots who are now jobless, yeah, they'll probably have some good savings, but for how long? You know, and, and that's the thing. And usually when people earn a lot more money, they spend a lot more money especially the UK, we're, we're, we're the biggest spenders in the world in the UK. A lot of people live hand to mouth. They can't afford to go one month without income. So this is the reality. And I know people don't like to talk about it. And they like to read all the positives that's going on about V-shaped recovery and all this stuff. But people need to understand, <laughs> <laughs> people need to understand um, the magnitude of what's happened. And if, you know, if people uh, a young enough and fortunate enough not to have, not to have experienced 2008 I didn't really experience it I was too young but I'm like a historian to all this stuff I love to read about it then I'd encourage you to go and watch you know the film the big short it's on Netflix oh, <laughs> I love you know that I love film. that film but you know places um, companies uh, so the Lehman brothers you know nobody um the Lehman Brothers didn't tell anybody they was going bust or they was in financial difficulty. They just come out one Monday morning and was like, look, this is what's happening. So, you know, there's a lot being hidden. And, you know, the big institutions is probably going to hit those first. So I do see, um, especially some of the retail banks, I do see those failing. And I think this is why they're going to be rolling out the central bank digital currencies. Because I think, you know, the central bank knows what's going on. Yeah, yeah, they know, they know. Yeah, and about the if you want to see another movie as well, Margin Call is good oh, as well. Amazing film. I think that's that's Lehman Brothers inside, mm. right? Yes, what amazing yeah. film. Yes, amazing film. Yeah, those those two films, I, I watched them like repeat like for the several years. <laughs> I just loved them. Yeah, and and they like get better every time. Yeah. 
So what should, I mean, let's say if you're into property, you're still into property because this podcast is about property and you do invest in property, yeah. even if you, you are on a halt right now because you see everything that's happening. And I love that you're so raw, raw and straightforward. Mm. That's why I wanted to have you as a guest because mm. it's a lot of people just, just sugarcoat everything. Mm. So... <laughs> What should you calculate on your deals in this current climate? So I suppose it all depends what um, part of property you're in. So, you know, if, you, if you're looking at sort of the BRR model that I know a lot of, especially um, newer investors love the BRR model, is one that I loved. Um, you, you've got to understand, you know, if you're taking investors' money and credit lines dry up, because this is what definitely could happen. Um, we've already seen the banks show their exposure They've already dropped loan to values, increased deposits. There's still down valuations, which baffles me because when you look at having record months for house prices and then the same month you can you get a survey out there down valuing <laughs> I just deals. I don't I don't <laughs> get it. It doesn't make any sense. So um if I if I was going to a BRR deal right now, I'd be looking at literally I know it sounds um uh quite extreme, but I personally would be looking at a deal just in case I'd be looking at a 30% fall in price. Um, I definitely wouldn't take investors' money and I'd have definitely 12 months mortgage reserves. Now, I know people are saying three months and six months is, is still a lot of mortgage reserves and 30% sounds a lot, but if credit lines freeze and people default on debt and people can't pay their rent or their mortgage, then house prices are going to drop. If you can't buy houses, if you if, if there's no mortgage, you know, the mortgage product is the most important thing in the housing model. Without the mortgage product, there is no model for housing. People can't buy houses. Only the rich can buy houses. So, and the people who drive the housing market mainly are home buyers. So, if there's no one in the market to buy homes because there's no credit available and they haven't got savings adequate for downturns, then house prices will fall. And if they fall and they fall substantially. You know, you've got to be prepared for it. So looking forward, look, I, I don't think this could happen probably potentially in the next six months. You would think it would happen with all the incentives ending. But I, 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 I would think that they're probably going to push them along a little bit further and they're going to think of something else to make to try and avoid this while they get the digital currencies ready and in full motion. And who knows? I think there's going to be massive changes in government policy. Um, you know, who knows? But. I, I was thinking the only way out really would be sort of like a debt jubilee, but because um, it would probably start in the states. But when you look at the states, um, the Fe you know they, they balance. I think they're about twenty seven trillion in debt now, and I think on their balance sheet there's about three point eight trillion in assets. So you know they, they, they're heavily over leveraged. But the problem with this is <laughs> their assets, um, the, the three point eight trillion is mainly student loan debt. So. They haven't really got any assets. So if you have a debt jubilee, it's going to blow things up even worse. So a debt jubilee looked like it was on the horizon. Um, the only thing I can see that's going to actually get the economy moving again is an, a universal base income. I think that is. I don't think there's any other way to get the velocity of money moving. Um, and, you know, I think they're going to have to roll out a UBI with a time attached to it. So I think, let's say they give every person in the UK... I don't know, 800 or a thousand pounds a month. They'll have to spend it within four or five weeks. And I think that's the only way to get people transacting in the economy. Um, you know, how can you have economic growth if everyone's shut down? It's impossible. <laughs> you, can print, yeah. you can print money, yeah. but you can't grow as an economy if everything's closed. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> so Rishi... I think it was like two weeks ago, or if it was mm. last week, he uh, said that he's thinking about changing the capital gain tax. Mm. Could you explain what his thoughts is and what that would mean for the market? Well, when you're looking at capital gains, right, I think that they've printed a lot of money and they're trying to use um, an increase in taxes, taxes to try and recuperate some money. But this isn't going to touch the surface. The amount of money that's being printed is not going to do anything. I think it's more of a um, more for them to look like they're trying to look. This is why we're going to try and recover the money this way. Um, 
And when you look, think about capital gains, um, like the average person thinks that's just going to target the rich people. So it looks like they're doing something to help that average person that's struggling at the moment um, by, ta by increasing capital gains. But let's look at capital gains, right? You're going to earn capital gains on things like flips. Like, let's be fair, flips are dead right now. You know, the going, I wouldn't definitely wouldn't be going into a flip right now. And the reason why I wouldn't is when credit lines do start to freeze up. <laughs> So it's not just it's not just the person who you're whatever you're buying now, whether it's bridging finance or whatever you're doing, whether you're doing um, the refinance model and you need a mortgage to to exit. Regardless of all this, with flips right now, the person that's buying the flip needs credit, right? You've do, you, the, the, most people are flipping houses to home buyers. If there's no credit for home buyers, and this another thing with them, um, I feel there's a bit of dis disconnect right now. If we just use a hundred thousand pounds as an example, just a quite a easy figure to um, to start this with. So if you had a, if you bought a house for a hundred thousand, sorry, if your house is up um, on the market for a hundred thousand um, pounds, and someone's just overpaid and paid one fifteen or one twenty for it, right? This isn't even this is this is just normal that's happening right now. People are overpaying by ten twenty grand in even lower value houses. I dread to think what people are paying over the odds on in places like London. But what's happening is this house is on the market for 100K. Someone's just had an offer accepted at 120. The surveyors come out and downvalued it to 90 because of COVID and being conservative and all this. This is this is exactly what's happening. I've experienced this with free finances this year. Um, and there's like a 20 or 30K disconnect between between the two so a home buyer who's purchasing the house it's taken them a long time to save up for their initial deposit and now they gotta go and pull out another 20 or 30 grand and it's it's just not happening so house sales have been through the roof because of all the pent-up demand completions on the other hand i'd love to see how many of these sales turn into completions so yeah going back to the capital um, gains tax i i just feel that is a way that um, they're trying. I think that the government right now don't really know what's what's right and what's wrong. You know, I don't know what's right and what's wrong either. But I think that because <laughs> because this is what's going on and that they, they, they're trying to do anything they can and history would say, okay, if we need to recuperate money, we just raise taxes. That's that's the oldest play in the playbook. And But, you know, <laughs> these taxes won't work to recoup the money that they've printed, you know. They're going to keep printing regardless. And I did see a... Um, an article yesterday or the day before and it said that the central banks at the moment around the world are printing 1.2 billion an hour every hour so wow. <laughs> increasing capital gains tax is, is definitely not the answer not right now and it, just before we move on when you think about taxes right now you know you got to think people are uh, uh, even though people think there's a lot of money out there and everyone's the, the banks are liquid i keep hearing these sayings um it's at the moment, people are struggling. People are struggling. You know, they they not just with their financially, but they're also struggling mentally. You know, they, their whole life's changed in, in, and they did definitely didn't expect it. So when you're struggling financially, um, regardless of what tax bracket you're in and you see any increase in taxes, that's not going to encourage people to spend more money. For them to get this um, economy moving, they need people spending money and transacting. By taxing them more, that's not yeah. going to make them spend no more money. So I think that we they need to... A bit, a bit more common sense discussed um, when thinking about these things because I feel like they're making very rash decisions because nobody knows what's going on and no one understands how how long it's going to go on for. And, you know, it's a hard job. No one expected COVID to do what, what it's done. But rash decisions, I'd rather than wait another couple of months and keep everybody in suspense and come come up with something good than just coming out you know, they change their mind all the time. You only need to watch the news and week by week, <laughs> something changes. And it's, uh, they need to just think about stuff first and think, how are we going to get this economy moving? And that's why I think UBI will be brought in. I think it's the last resort, but I think it's the only thing that's going to make any difference at all. So people that want to invest, they should basically just be cautious. Yeah, I think that, it's never a thing where you just wait on the sidelines, right? I do believe you should always be in the game. I think, that, and at the end of the day, you can wake up tomorrow and the whole stock market could look red. But that doesn't mean there's no opportunities there. So, um, you know, there's, there's always something in the green. Regardless of what's going on, if some, 
if one asset is performing very badly or a bunch of assets, there's always something that's that's doing good. So you can invest. That's why I think about understanding and having some sort of base knowledge across multiple asset classes. Because if you're, say you're fully bullish just on property and that's, that's what you're specializing in and then property takes a downturn, then what are you going to do? Just wait for it to come back? What if it takes two, three, four or five years? You know, the, the, you can't just wait on the sidelines. I think that invest, but invest cautiously. But I do believe people should stay invested because what else are you going to do? The, the UK base rate is 0.1%. <laughs> you, can, you can leave it in the bank <laughs> if you want, but there's things out there performing well right now. You know, there, there's, there's always stuff that's performing good. Yeah. And how is the temperature like you know in the beginning we're, because the listeners most of them are either from uh, scandinavia or from the states there are some from the uk but how is the temperature in the uk amongst people are they thinking that oh i might not get my job back or are they like yeah i will get my back back and my job back because i'm just furloughed so how how is the temperature now? I know in the beginning it was people like seeing it as a holiday. Um, I think yeah, at the start people enjoyed it, and then I think that it became very real when some people went back to work and others didn't. And um, I have a few friends who are still on furlough, and I've told them myself. I said, look, if you're still on furlough now from back in March or April, or whenever it was, then I very much doubt you're going to be going back to work. And a few of them are quite resistant and they're like, nah, it's going to be okay. But I feel like they're just lying to themselves. And, you know, if you're, if, yeah. if you're, if your uh, employer doesn't need you back now and you've been on furlough for a majority of the year, then I can't see people going back to work. So I think the tension is rising and I think people um, have had a bit of a reality check. Now Christmas is approaching and they started to realize that, you know, I'm not, I'm, they're not sure if they got a job or not anymore. So I think that the temperature is definitely rising. And um, like I said, the government incentives at the moment are doing, is, is, I think they're in place to um, to stop civil unrest because I think that a lot of civil unrest is about to come when people can't get money. And if banks fail, they the, the central bank and the government needs to make a decision on, do we bail out the banks in the middle of a health and financial crisis? And that's going to be, when there's people with no money, that's not going to look good if they bail the banks out and don't help the people. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what what their thoughts are when this starts to happen and starts to play out and furlough does actually end because it can't come on, go on forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So then maybe the way forward could be if you're doing property, maybe social housing then. Yeah. Well, what's your thought about that? So I was asked this question yesterday, actually, a, a property... Um, uh, presentation and I think that the opportunities in property um, when this does happen and we do have a pullback I think social housing is massive um, it's probably one of my favorite strategies and it's something that I haven't explored yet um, but I, the, the fact you can get a five or ten year lease on something and just forget about it I think it's gonna is will have huge opportunities in social housing off the back of this um, I also think that there will be opportunities in commercial property after this because a lot of property that is going to have no use um, anymore for what it was previously, and a lot of the high streets are going to have no use. So m m the bigger the bigger units are probably going to be turned into like Amazon fulfillment centers and um, other fulfillment centers. Um, they'll just be like ghost towns. <laughs> but I think that there's going to be a lot of <laughs> um, a lot of high streets, especially the smaller ones that are probably going to have to be turned into residential high streets opposed to um, commercial um, and semi-commercial just because there's going to be no use. Um, obviously, is is people do need to start setting up businesses more now and stop relying on employers. But at the same time, a lot of people are scared to do that. And there's not huge amounts of help at the moment for that. If you set up a business in the middle of COVID, you haven't received any help because your business wasn't set up in time. So yeah, I think commercial, uh, there will be massive opportunities, um, social housing. And another one that I think, is, uh, when when things do start, and people start to move about a little bit more, I think service accommodation is gonna be huge. Um, the reason why I think this is because um, actual travel and um, flying places, I think we're a long, long way away from people being confident to go back to the way it was. I think we could potentially be a couple of years away from hitting the levels back 
what that we was hitting last year. Um, you know, even now, I was on a plane a few weeks ago, and you know, you can't sit in the same row as somebody. I was looking at people, and they couldn't sit in the same row if they didn't know them. So I'm looking at the back of the plane, and I'm thinking, there's one person in a row of three. So you know, they're being very careful wow. with what's going on, and airlines can't oper- can't operate at those levels anyway. So it wouldn't surprise me if a lot a lot of the airlines fail, and then you have people like Amazon and Tesla come into that world as well because that 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 could quite easily happen and um so it's yeah i think that service accommodation could be huge because people have been stuck in their hometowns all year and because they they've been told they can't go out of their hometowns they want to go out of their hometowns so even if they wasn't big travelers or um they didn't move around a lot um before covid because they've been told they have to stay there it's making them want to explore other places so service accommodation when people start to move around a little bit more whenever that is i think that people are going to be happy to even drive half an hour down the road and stay in an apartment or a house in the town just over from theirs just to do something so yeah i think that service accommodation could be another great opportunity um, when things do start to move around again yeah so maybe that will be the revival of blackpool again <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so how much money do you think the government can just keep on printing and giving before they start to uh, actually see that it doesn't work personally i don't know it's you know it's looking like they just have an unlimited pot <laughs> if you look at the fed <laughs> and the amount of stimulus that they've been doing it's like there's just an open ended pot to take from and that's basically what they've given to the cent- uh, the central banks have basically given to the retail banks it's not so much like they've given them say a billion or a trillion here have this to the institutions they basically it's like they got open credit line where it's like this is how much is there you can take from it as and when you need so i don't really know it's hard to say like the fact that because it is fiat money now it's it, it, it's quite irrelevant of how much they print now regardless like if you look at the velocity of money and the amount they've printed like um if you look at 2008 to 2012 to come out of the financial crisis and return to normality they printed around two trillion dollars right and when covid first happened they printed that same amount in a couple of months so when they printed the same amount in a few months and people are still looking at this like this isn't as bad they would never have done that and if you look at um the amount they're still they're still pumping into the market even though they're saying we're waiting we're waiting for this second round of stimulus the amount of money that's being put out there because it's so irrelevant now and it's not moving the velocity of money it doesn't matter if they print 100 trillion the velocity of money isn't moving because the public aren't out there transacting there's no there's not enough transactions in the economy to to get that velocity of money moving and it's, if you look at the velocity of money chart on the Fed's website, it's been in free fall since 2008. So even though since they started to do this heavy printing, the velocity of money has been going down because they've crossed over. So the 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 money that the currency supply is going up and the velocity is going down. So it's it's quite crazy when you look at it, really. So yeah, I think that they could just continue to print. I think this is why. Um, they're looking at Bretton Woods 2.0. This is why they're looking at um, a completely monetary reform because it's needed. This What they're doing now just isn't working and they've been doing it for a very long time and I feel that they know it's coming to an end. And if you look in the right places, you can see that the IMF, the World Economic Forum, the BIS, all these companies, they're saying it. It's in front of our eyes. They're not hiding it from us. So I know there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that are saying there's going to be a reset they're planning a reset well yeah just go on the world economics forums website they tell you this is the great reset <laughs> they're not hiding it you just need to look <laughs> on their website <laughs> yeah so can you can you explain the two different type of what emf are looking to do one of the reset and the other teas that you mentioned before the reset um so yeah so if the imf button woods 2.0 so um the, the original Bretton Woods system brought a lot of um, countries together, right? And um, it, was, it, was all, it was mainly about exchange rates. But Bretton Woods 2.0, the, the, it's, I think it's going to be very different because how many countries are going to actually want to be on board this time? Because it was, if you look at 
the US dollar, right? So every barrel of oil in the world needs to be sold in US dollars. And how many countries are going to continue to want to do this? So in every basket right now, every country needs to have dollars. And, and obviously, it was a great move by America. You know, it, it, the, the, the value of the dollar um, was substantial because of this. Everybody needed to trade in dollars. But there was a, um, there was a few countries. So it was like China and a lot of the Southern Asian countries. Um, they formed the new trade block. Um by themselves so the eu used to have it was a very very good trade block and has been known for as a good trade block for a long time and when brexit first came around i was a bit i was more of like you know i didn't want to leave the eu i was one of those who's like i don't want to leave this you know what what are we doing and the more this has happened now and the less relevant the eu is becoming as a trade block because of the emergence of of asia the middle east and all of those, and China, and all of these countries. Now, I think that Brexit could become more beneficial just because you can we can strike our own deals with those with different trade blocks and different countries. So the IMF this time, I'm not sure how many countries are going to want to take part in their little system and their little scheme. Um, but you know, who, who knows? You know, the thing is now, I think that this is going to lead to huge currency wars. When you think about, um, you got all these different countries. Like the entire world is working on their own CBDCs now, right? Everyone wants their own digital currency. So, if you think now, me and you are talking on Zoom right now. Now on Zoom, let's say me and you are striking a deal, right? You're in Sweden, I'm in the UK, and me and you just strike struck a deal, or we've JV'd on something, and whatever deal it was, this tax payable, right? Now because of Zoom, we we're able to do this with technology now when this digital currency is involved let's say there was an exchange of money now which which country is going to have the benefits of that tax so there's a lot of things that's changing and because things are going to become digital and blockchains moving forward at like exponential pace i don't a lot of people aren't ready for it and that's why i think the fed hasn't released their second round of stimulus i think that the reason why they're saying it's going to be after the election because they did say that they were going to have their digital dollar ready by January the 1st, 2021. But maybe they, it isn't ready. Maybe it's not going to be ready in time. So maybe they're going to wait for a second round of stimulus to happen. Uh, so they, they wait for their e-wallet to be ready before they launch their second round of stimulus. So it's going to be an interesting 24 months, um, especially with different people striking different deals. And when you look at... Um, countries like to me if i was going to be investing in the markets right now i'd definitely be looking at um places like india china all of southern asia all of those countries you know the, i think middle east i think th there's so much growth in those countries and if you look at india they got a very young population there's a lot going on they're implementing technology um throughout throughout the whole nation I think that w there's a big shift happening and with China has been happening for a very long time, but we've just been oblivious to it because in the UK and America, this people are so like one dimensional and tunnel vision, like, oh, this, we're the most powerful in the world. And, and they just, they just allowed like other, other places to just grow at a huge pace under the radar. And, you know, like, China's already using the, the, digi uh, the digital yuan. It's already in circulation in the Bay Area of Hong Kong. Is you know they, they've already had I think it was like three hundred million transactions or something like that. I read. So they're already ahead of us. And I think that so all these things that are going on, the World Economic Forum is more about a bunch of people who are obsessed with control and power. So if you look at anything that they put out, any videos or articles. It just feels that they're just obsessed with power and control over people. Um, so I, I try not to take too much notice of those. But you know, they, 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 you know, they, they obviously have um, they have a say in all what's going on. But I'd rather look at the changes that's going to directly affect us um, as normal civilians. But that they, they're more about skimming off the top, and <laughs> and that's that's all, literally all they care about. And uh, it's actually it's called the the Cantillon effect. And this is like when basically central banks print money um, and it doesn't go to everyone evenly. It just goes to political insiders and basically the individuals at the World Economic Forum. So they basically get maximum benefit because they get it first. And then 
if it does ever get to the general public, our purchasing power goes down because the people at the top and the insiders sell. So they, they, these people are incentivized to reset the economy, drop rates to negative, because the worse the economy does, the more that gets printed, the richer those insiders get. And that's not even conspiracy. That's literally, you can read this and watch their videos, and this is their plan. So yeah, I, I try not to take too much notice of those at the moment. I'm just more concerned of when the CBDCs get rolled out, how it's going to affect us personally. Yeah. So you mentioned Brexit that you uh, that you for it now. Mm. How do you think the the housing market will uh, take Brexit? I know we have it's been about COVID, COVID mm. this year, but uh, how do you think it will get an effect as well? Um, at first, when we first before COVID, I thought that it would have, um, just because of the uncertainty and there was no trade deal done or anything so i thought it could have um you know even when i was refinancing a few deals around brexit i was you know i thought they was going to be very conservative based on brexit um but now i'm not sure i think that um because of deglobalization and everything that's going on i think that it could potentially maybe not short term but long term it could be beneficial um especially a lot of chinese investors are still investing in london and the uk at Manchester, Birmingham. Um, well, actually, there are a lot of them investing outside of London. And so it's still quite a desirable place to invest, um, the UK is. So maybe it could have a positive effect. You know, maybe not. It's, 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 but yeah, I, th I personally think it could have a positive effect long term. But who knows? We're just going to have to wait, wait and see because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, and from next year, they're gonna uh, all we foreigners. They're gonna give us a extra two percent stamp duty because we're a uh, non UK directors. Yeah. So they're trying to get in all of the tax that they can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so what about uh, Bitcoin and gold? Is that the way forward? And is if so, why? Um, I do believe so. Um, you know, the fact that Bitcoin is decentralized and there is only 21 million in existence, you know, along with the fact that it's the best performing asset over the last 10 years, um, over the last five years and over this and this year. Um, so, yeah, I believe it's going to be looked at more as a store of value than gold um, for the future. And, you know, you've seen recently, if you look like you've had JP Morgan, PayPal, Fidelity, Square, Michael, uh, Michael Saylor, MicroStrategy, they've all started to endorse Bitcoin now. So, you know, and like, like I said, it's, it's, the market cap's only around 300 billion at the moment. So it is like a mid cap S&P 500 company right now. It's, it's a lot of growth to, um, to be done. And when you, like I said, when you look at gold at the $10 trillion market cap and Bitcoin at only a 300 billion. Now, when you think a 1 million to 1 billion is a huge difference. 1 billion to 1 trillion is unimaginable. So it's nowhere near where he could go. Um, you know, if Bitcoin at some point does replace gold as a more secure, safe haven in the new world, then yeah, I think it's definitely got a long way to go. But yeah, gold and Bitcoin are two different things in my opinion. And I'm invested in both um, because who knows where the world is going. But if I had to bet on it, I would say that I'm 95% sure that Bitcoin's going to be a better store of value than gold going forward um, because you can use it to purchase stuff if you want. So with gold, you know, the days of me coming to buy something from you with a gold coin or a bar is gone. <laughs> um, but <laughs> if people can, if they want to, they can pay with Bitcoin. And if you look at what PayPal's done now, they've incorporated it so you can buy, sell, hold and trade with Bitcoin. Um, and Bay PayPal was one of the ones that said it was a massive scam. And so was JP Morgan. JP Morgan said that it was the bi a big fraud. And then this year, and that was only a few years ago. And then this year, they've said that it has considerable upside as a store of value over gold. So each day, there's, there's news articles coming out um, saying how big corporations and um, institutions are endorsing Bitcoin. So I think... Um, both gold and Bitcoin have their place, but I'm more bullish on Bitcoin long term, regardless of how many pullbacks it has over the next year or so. So then then I have a follow up question. How are companies getting how do they pay 
tax with Bitcoin. You, you know what I mean? Because the government won't get any money then if their people are just using Bitcoin. So this Bitcoin is becoming regulated and it will become regulated probably worldwide. At the moment, it has no jurisdiction. So when it becomes regulated, um, people think that Bitcoin's this thing that people no one can track and trace and all this and because it's decentralized. But you'll be surprised um, how much it can be tracked. And when you look at, um, say, the FBI, I think they seized like one billion recently off some uh, cartel boss. <laughs> um, and I think <laughs> FBI uh, are one of, have got one of the biggest holdings of Bitcoin. So it feels like, you know, the, the states are acquiring a lot of Bitcoin in their own way. China sees a load of Bitcoin, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before as well. Um, so with the new system that they're creating, if they're going to create it around Bitcoin being a part of it and having existence, and that's what they are talking about at the moment, it could change and they could try and ban it. They did ban gold a long time ago for, for a period of time. So they could ban Bitcoin. Um, it would be hard because if one country bans it, another will endorse it. Some of the smaller countries wouldn't really have the infrastructure to put in place the same rules and regulations that the bigger ones do. Um, and, you know, if you look at companies, I think it was Iran or Iraq, one of them said that they wanted to start doing all their exports in crypto now. So uh, countries are endorsing it more. So when it comes to tax, I'm sure they're going to have something put in place to track a lot of this. And when their e-wallets and their sort of ledgers are available, I'm sure they're going to have some sort of technology involved to try and tax it one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So what are your predictions with the UK economy in the future? Brexit, COVID, all of this, that. What do you think? Well... Brexit and, and if I could be even more on you, if you could give like a, a timeline. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Um, Brexit, I'm not sure which way is going to go totally. I would say long term will be more beneficial, but it could have a negative effect at the start um, based on the uncertainty, etc. Um, COVID, I think this isn't going away for a very long time. Um, I think cash is definitely on his way out fairly swiftly. Um, I think, like I said earlier, our debt issue isn't getting any better. Um, so like I said, raising taxes isn't enough to sort the debt problem. So yeah, I think we're going to see a UBI um, to help the public or some form of helicopter money. Um, I can't see the debt. They may do some sort of debt jubilee, but I'm not sure how that's going to play out. So I think over the next 24 months, I think is when we're going to feel um, there will be a reset. I think that we're going to have a huge pullback within 24 months. It could happen sooner, but because of COVID and how long it's going to last, I think they're going to continue to put things in place to keep the hope and confidence out there, not just because of um, the economy, but mainly because to keep, just to try and avoid civil unrest. Um, I think that's going to be a, a bad concern. Like if you look back at the start, of the year or mid part of the year when um, we had a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff happening, right? The news just completely took it out of proportion and they were was, they was showing all the bad things that were going on. It was like they wanted to show civil unrest. They didn't want to show nothing peaceful. They want to show everything bad like they do every day. You look at the news and they want to try and tell you how many COVID cases there are. They don't tell you about the recoveries. They want to tell you all about the bad. So if they already sort of promoted some sort of civil unrest and but I think they were sort of forced their hand because of social media that they couldn't blame sort of the protests for the increase in COVID numbers. So when people, were, um, you've seen a lot of um, very small minded people on Facebook and stuff saying, oh, this is going to pump up the COVID numbers, blah, blah, blah. But if you notice, the news tried not tried to stay away from blaming that. And so did the government. They didn't. I think that they was trying to avoid even more civil unrest. Um but yeah, it, was, it all happened very quickly. So I think they're going to keep trying to do things to avoid um, the civil unrest. But I think that within 24 months, we're definitely going to see a downturn. I can't say exactly like 18 months or 12 months, but I think within 24, it gives us enough time to, for them to make the decision of what's going on. And within that time, the digital currencies will be rolled out. So we're going to see exactly what their plans were or are going forward. So the downturn you mentioned, do you think it will be bigger than 2008? Yeah, 100%. I think that they're going to put um, a 
as much in place to try and avoid um, like a huge housing crash and stuff. But the whole point in doing a monetary reform and rolling out digital currencies is because if you think like fiat is just an experiment, fiat currency was just an experiment. You know, they, they took it off the gold standard and they just printed and printed and over time it's proven it doesn't work. Fiat currencies have a life cycle of around 25 years and they got a 100% failure rate, as is global reserve currencies, 100% failure rate. So we've come to the end of the cycle and the new cycle is going to be these new digital currencies. So if they were to start off by just printing, um, printing loads of money and just keep increasing the currency supply, I can't see them doing it just because of what's happened already. So if... If they don't increase the money supply and the banks don't have high reserves or the banks aren't liquid enough and they can't lend money at the start, then I don't see any other way other than a very substantial drop in house prices and the stock market 100% is very, in my opinion, is very overvalued. Just this year, <laughs> yeah. you know, Tesla, they become a $100 billion company this year and a $500 billion company in the same year. You've got <laughs> Apple become a $1 trillion company this year and a $2 trillion company in the same year. So these valuations are crazy. Um, so I think there's definitely room for massive pullbacks in both the housing and the stock market. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would assume we're looking at around at least 30%. We could, eat, we could drop a lot more, but... I think it'll be worse than 2008 because, um, yeah, I just think 2008 was bad, but we've never experienced what's going on right now. And we've we've done what we did in 2008 on a bigger level when it comes to stimulus, and it hasn't worked, and it still hasn't worked. And even with the vaccine, there's not enough to, to vaccinate the world. So com countries like India and China, how are you going to... There's not enough vaccines to vaccinate those countries. So... Regardless of if you start vaccinating some, the only way to stop this virus or whatever people want to call it is if you say you vaccinate everyone in Sweden, then if that's the case, then people can't leave Sweden because if they leave, then you, you, you're not solving the problem until the whole world's vaccinated if that's what they want to do. So I think it's going to go on for a very long time. Um, so I think that, yeah, the downturn is going to be pretty hefty. Yeah. And when the downturn happened, will you then go back into the market and just purchase like everything or are you going to hold on? Um, no, I'm, I'm, if, if the opportunity arises, I will buy. Like I think that um, there are things that can affect, especially the housing market going forward. Like tech is basically eating everything and tech's just <laughs> took over the world. So I think that when tech moves into property, like the 3D print construction and modular builds, I think that that could affect the housing market because you can be building houses for a fraction of the price. Um, but so I do believe at some point in the near future, um, maybe in the next 20 years that we're going to, you could basically build your house online so you can pick everything online and this stuff will just turn up flat packed and the carpenter will put it together. And that's I literally, I think that that's the way it's going to go. Same as cars, you're just going to just do it all online. But um yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, I, it's hard. It's, it's it's hard to say really, but I think yeah. With I will be buying. I definitely will be buying um, because I am bullish on property long term until tech comes in. But um, yeah, especially good companies, good stocks. If I see a good stock and it's got a good balance sheet, it's a good company. Um, then yeah, I'll be buying again definitely. Yeah. So what are you going to do moving forward? Um, I'll just continue to stay up to date with what's going on in the world. Stay prepared. You know, if you don't stay prepared, you'll become a victim. I'll stay open-minded. I always challenge my opinion. So if what the, the, my opinion today may change tomorrow, you know, if I, I always try and look at the opposite opinion. Um, you know, I don't like, I see a lot of people, they allow like cognitive dissonance to kick in and they just look for their confirmation bias. So they're right. And, you know, you're not going to get anywhere like that. So I'm, I'll, I stay challenging my opinion. I always look at what the opposite opinion to mine is, and I reassess. So that I'll continue to do that, and until my mind changes on crypto, um, yeah, I'm just going to be staying, stay invested in crypto. Look at different um, cryptocurrencies and what they're doing, and yeah, that's probably what I'll stay doing. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. You're always updating you. I can always see that on your Instagram. And so mm. people should definitely follow you. Thank so you. I have these three questions mm. or four questions that I always ask my guests. Okay. So this conversation, by the way, I've been epic. I love it. And I hope people that are listening that you liked it. It's a bit different from uh, the usual property stuff. Mm. But as I mentioned in the beginning economics go hand in hand with property so mm. if it, if it's a bad <laughs> bad year or bad economy then obviously your property is gonna be affected by that yeah so either way if you had unlimited funds who would you be who would be your mentor <sighs> this is a very difficult one <laughs> um because there's literally like no one person um i would like to explore the qualities of different people if i had unlimited funds um you know, there's a few people i admire and what they have accomplished you know such as like elon musk buffett dalio bill ackerman lebron james michael jordan like the list is huge it'd be very hard for me to pick one specific you need to pick one i need to pick one okay um i would probably pick either buffett or ray dalio that's a good choice okay so then we go into books so the first one it doesn't need to be property if you could recommend one book to your daughters because mm. you have three right yeah what book would that be? <sighs> Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's the easiest read. And I believe it shows you the basics of finance. And it, and it, start, it makes you think differently. And I read that book when I was 15. So I, I believe it's quite an easy book for a child to read and understand. Um, but also it's, it's a great book for someone like 40 or 50 to read. It's, yeah, I would say Rich Dad, Poor Dad for my children first. Yeah. Definitely. I gave that book to my mom uh, last year because when I went into property, she was like, yeah, I don't understand all mm -hmm. of this. Why are you doing, you know, I'm about read this book. And then <laughs> the <laughs> old thinking that you've been offering, you will change your mindset. And she was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a great book. And it's, it's, it's like, it's timeless. You know, it's timeless. Yes. Great book. So one book for every investor. And this one doesn't need to be a property as well. I would probably say um, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham or Principles by Ray Dalio. I think both of those books um, are great. Um, the, the Intelligent Investor is a very deep and hard read. But even if it takes you a year to understand the book, I think it's quite essential when you're looking at anything when you start investing. So I would say... Yeah, one of those. Yeah, I, I'm i like half through both of those books. Yeah. I, I have I have them on the Audible, but they're, they're amazing, like you mentioned. They're amazing, especially the, the Ray Dalio. Mm. Like you have systems on everything, and it's so crazy when you when you go into it so much detail. But that, that just makes you evaluate every person that you speak with every business everything oh yeah so yeah it's a, two good good books mm. and finally one property book so the only book i've read that is just property related is before the hammer falls um which is a great book um very good book so i would um yeah i would say if anyone's in property i think that from what i got from the book it's a great book to read. Yeah, and who is who is it with? But I think that is is I'm not sure. I think, let me just check a sec before the, I have a look because I'm pretty sure um, I actually was recommended this, but I should know. You know, I've <laughs> I should definitely know. So <laughs> oh, so a lot of books. Yeah, right? so is uh, is Jay Howard and Peter Rusinek. So yeah, the, okay. very, very it's a very good book. You know, um, I I was. Because I was already in property, um, I took prop. I done a lot of property education. Um, I didn't really read a lot of property books, so but I look. I read this one because I was very interested in learning more about auction. And yes, yeah, it's, it's a great book. Okay, 
So D, thank you very much for this hour episode. It has been great. How can people get in touch with you? How can they like get into the 5 a.m. club? Because you need to talk about that. <laughs> This is your time to shine. You already shine now one hour, but shine more, okay. my friend. Uh, firstly, I really appreciate the invite. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, that's first. Um, if you people want to follow me, um, Instagram is probably the best. Is at D, D E underscore Ludlow. And the 5 a.m. club is a network of um, basically like-minded individuals that we're looking to grow our network and grow our knowledge uh, we've got hours of educational content on the portal and we do have meetups i know covid sort of um put a spanner in the works but we we try and meet up um we was trying to meet up as much as possible we have a ski trip next year so a, we've got a lot going on we're looking to take it to the next level and this week we did a launch our we pre-launched our academy which is going to be live in february 2021 um we have some great mentors and great people that specialize in their field so yeah, the 5 a.m. club's all about growth, personal growth and network. And the website is www.jointhe5amclub.co.uk. You can also find it across social media platforms too. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Yes. <laughs> there you have it, people. And I'll put everything in the show notes. And I would have been on this 5 a.m. club, but I work nights, so no. I can't. <laughs> that that that's my excuse. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. When I'm... <laughs> There's a rewind feature. You can watch it back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> he got me there, people. He got me there. <laughs> okay, people, take care and don't be stressed. Invest. I love Bye. it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> that's awesome.